Hi, everybody out there. With us today is Mark Collinsworth of Vera Global Financial Wealth Management, financial expert who watches trends financially and how it affects the nation's other directions, and longtime AP newsman and uh, columnist and, and um, journalist, uh, Brian Thomas, uh, to my left there on the screen. So today's subject is the calls to impeach Supreme Court justices and to expand the Supreme Court which is a reaction to their overturning Roe versus Wade, the gun control decision, and now the, 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 today's decision on a, a coach, uh, football coach being in his, uh, in his rights to pray on the sidelines privately. And uh, that's, uh, that's um, free speech. So the Supreme Court upheld that, that there was no conflict between church and state. So one, this is three decisions in a row, more to come that are upsetting the liberals and they're uh, taking drastic action. Now we'll start with Brian Thomas. Uh, we'll, <clears throat> we'll start with Brian Thomas. Brian, is any of this warranted or is this really overreach? Well, I, I think it, nothing will come of it. I don't think they're going to expand the court and I don't think they're going to impeach any members of the court. You'll hear a lot of squawking, but I don't think in the end, any of that will occur. <clears throat> what will happen I think, is that um, the Democrats will use this abortion decision uh, and are already doing it as cannon fodder for the November election. And if they keep people as revved up as they are now, uh, that, that could bode well for them maintaining both houses of Congress. But really, I mean, how many votes is that really going to change? I mean, the camps are already entrenched on both sides. So you may get a few crossovers because of these decisions. But I don't think it's enough to stop the, the, the uh, impending and ex expected red wave. Uh, Mark, no. what do you think? Um, I would agree with that because I've already seen people on, you know, watching the news. There's already people blaming Joe Biden for this. So if they're blaming Joe Biden for Roe v. Wade, they're certainly not going to vote for him. And then just from a historical standpoint, when people go and vote, they always vote with their pocketbooks. You've heard those saying it's the economy stupid. Um, they're going to send a message come November to the current um, White House that they don't like how things are going. And they are going to bring a red wave to express their discontent with everything Joe Biden has done. But Brian, you don't see it that way. Explain no, first of all, the abortion issue has been nothing but a con to get votes since Roe versus Wade in 1973. It's nothing more than that. It is just a trick by the Republicans to mine for votes. That's all it's ever been. That's all it ever will be. A lot of people don't see through that, but I think it's, it's one of the great tragedies of the American political system that people are tricked by this year after year after year. And it took 50 years for them to do anything to Roe versus Wade at all. All right, let, let, let's say this is posturing on both sides. Let's just assume that for the sake of argument here. Again, my question is, it's, uh, it's not gonna change that many people because it, both sides, both camps are deeply entrenched in their opinions on this. So how do you see this actually stopping the expected red wave? I don't think, I don't think any, every, everybody is as entrenched as you think they are. Um, if, if people turn out for marches and rallies throughout the, the summer and fall, as we've seen now, and my guess is <clears throat> it'll peak in the next couple of weeks and then ebb off a little bit. But if, if, if the marches stay focused and peaceful, um, you may see some movement in the polls. It all depends on, on what the short-term polling shows in some of the bigger swing states. My take would be the exact opposite, that the more they keep this up, the more people are going to say enough already. You know, you're overdoing it. Uh, give it a rest. Uh, how do you see it, Mark? Well, I think, you know, just from listening to the news, I've already seen you know, that, you know, Friday there was huge turnouts and protests, huge protests on Saturday. By Sunday and day, they've already started dropping off. So people have already forgotten about this. But I think the most important thing here is, and, and I'm going to use what Ruth Ginsburg said, Roe, Roe v. Wade was never about abortion. It's been misinterpreted for decades. And she even said it will be the ghost that will come back to haunt 
the Supreme Court, and it will be overturned if the legislature does not take action to make a law. Supreme Court does not make laws, the legislature. And that comes back to the Democrats who didn't want to bring it to a vote because no Democrat wanted to go on the record in 1972 that they supported abortion and they just drug it out. Yeah, in fact, uh, Ginsburg uh, was the poster woman of, uh, of the left, of uh, progressives, of the liberals. And she herself said it was flawed from the beginning and was just waiting to be overturned eventually, which it now has. Brian, uh, let me ask you this. Do you think uh, it was Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided 50 years ago? Probably not at the time. <clears throat> there was constant demonstration, if you remember, and you and I are old enough to remember that, um, constant demonstration going on throughout the country for this. Um, and many states had prohibited abortions. Um, Colorado was one of the very few states that had abortions way back in the early 70s. And I remember people leaving Connecticut to go to Denver to have the procedures done and then coming home again. That was common. Yeah. And Colorado was one of the very few states that had legal abortion. And people decided wanted to have a pregnancy termination, that it was safer to get on a plane and go to Denver than it was to fool around with somebody who wasn't medically astute enough to do the procedure. With a coat hanger, yeah. I, I know that argument, and I, I think there is legitimacy to that. But again, my basic question is, was it rightly or wrongly decided in terms of the Constitution 50 years ago? Well, you know, if they, if they took this... Um, vote today, it would never pass because the, the, the court is conservative. So um, I think what you're seeing is simply a reflection of what the court has become. That's all. I don't think it's any more than that. So you don't, think, I, you don't think it's a, there's a solid constitutional principle here that was wrongly decided 50 years ago? No, I don't. I don't see it that way at all. Well, technically, it was neither. The The original ruling that came out in what, 1972 was the actual ruling said a woman has a right, has a constitutional right to privacy in regard to an abortion. The Democrats took that and said, oh, she has a constitutional right to abortion. They left out the key words there. Abortion was never settled, not even in 1972. It was not settled. It's just been a can kicked down the road. And now the can is kicked back. Yeah. yeah, there's 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 a merit to that argument. Um, but, you know, it took a lot of years to get where we are today. Um, and I think what you have seen here is that John Roberts, uh, I think, has lost control of the court. Yep. As I think there's this, yeah. there's the three appointees by Trump completely obliterated his control of the court. And that's what we've seen here and what we will continue to see. And already you've seen uh, um, one of the justices talk about gay marriage now, um, Clarence Thomas. I mean, so, you know, true to my prediction, this was just the beginning of some of the things that are progressive in nature that the conservative movement doesn't want any part of and is now in a position to to change. Well, you know, what Thomas uh, uh, put out there, you know, is being interpreted as, you know, this is the beginning of a, of a domino effect. However, it, it may be, go down to the same principle. It's up to the states to decide. Don't forget the Constitution states, uh, <clears throat> those rights uh, not uh, enumerated in the Constitution to the federal government, in effect, uh, is, goes to the states. And that that's what, what this ruling reflects, basically, is that constitutional principle. So, I mean, whether you like it or not, and whether there are reasonable and humane arguments in terms of women are going to go back to back alleys again, there's going to be a lot of that uh, tragic uh, aborted abortion procedures again. If you stick with the Constitution, it's a different question. So, you know, do, do we do we do do we do we distort the Constitution in order to prevent some of these back uh, alley pregnant uh, abortions again, and doing so damage the Constitution in the name of, of, of humane procedures? I mean, it, to me, it's it, it's you know it's um, I can see both sides of this. Mark, well, I think you know 
I, I, I totally agree. I think John Roberts has really just lost control. He just really has um, – he, he's trying to be the, the new Kennedy. He's supposed to be trying to be the new swing boat, and that's just not working because he's already outnumbered the more conservatives on the court than, than he can overrule on. But th this is a problem because – you know, your states like California, Washington, Oregon, they're going to keep abortion legal. All you're going to see is people in Tennessee and Florida, they're going to jump on an airplane, fly to California, and they're still going to get an abortion. So uh, really, you've just created a, a brand new mess of logistics is really all you've done. Although for you know, women that don't have access to the money to fly or the opportunity to do it without right. her husband or boyfriend knowing yeah, there's going to be some of this back alley stuff. Again, I, I could see that happening. One of the uh, people in, who, who wrote, writes for The Atlantic, I can't think of her name, Caitlin, somebody or other, um, wrote a piece today saying that um, one of the things that disturbed her was in 1970, her mother told her uh, a litany of uh, egregious procedures were done with Lysol being injected into the womb and four that she knew of uh, could never conceive again. And the fourth woman, three of the four could never conceive again. And the fourth one died from the poison of Lysol. So there's gonna be all kinds of horror stories that are gonna come up, whether they're real, whether they're manufactured, whether they're exaggerated remains to be seen. But the minute poor women are prevented from making these kinds of decisions. And there's a lot of people in very populous states, Texas, Florida, Georgia, you know, a lot, a lot of these states where um, abortion is clearly in the crosshairs. Uh, it, it's gonna be a real issue for, for a lot of poor people. You know, something else, I mean, you know, 50 years ago, most people thought uh, the, the, the embryo in the womb uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't formed very well. It wasn't sentient. It didn't feel pain. We've learned since then that the further along this goes, uh, you know, especially now, now some of these states are talking about abortion up to the, up to birth actually. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, when it's that far along, you know, d doesn't this become murder of a human being? You know, maybe not in the first month or two, but after that, what you know, scientific studies have shown now that the fetus does feel pain, uh, you know, and, you know, it, it, it has all kinds of forms of, of limbs and the brain development and all that. So, I mean, can we ignore the fact that it's really a human being that could survive outside the womb the further along to go and it's being murdered? If the fetus can survive outside the womb, that can be a viable argument. However, um, there's no set of statutes uh, medically that state every woman can produce a, a viable fetus up to six months, up to five months, up to seven months. Every woman is different. And the, the argument there is that no one mandate is going to, one size does not fit all. And, and that's, that's the wrinkle in all of this. How would you fix the Supreme Court, Brian? I mean, I, I think you're obviously uh, somewhat disturbed <clears throat> the direction that the Supreme Court has taken now with the conservatives on there. So what would you do to remedy that? Would you expand it? Would you impeach it? What would you do? Pray that somebody else retires or dies and Biden gets another chance to put someone of, of, of a different stripe on the court. That's all, that's all I'm saying. All, all I'm saying is that we don't need to start vacuum cleaning the court uh, with, with, Im with impeachments or expanding it just because we don't like a certain decision. We have never done that before um, and, and we don't need to start that now. When the court swings to the left again and eventually it will, um, everybody on the right will start howling just like the people on the left are howling now. That's the way this always works out. You know, even FDR, who uh, is credited with doing so much to pull us out of the Depression, tried to pack the Supreme Court. And I think even his own party, uh, you know, turned against him on that. So, you that's know, true. It's, that's true. Yeah. But but uh, there's also been, you know, th these 
increased calls of uh, more protests and, you know, even already some violence. And again, the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland, isn't doing a darn thing about it to curb it. Now, the way the law reads, according to my understanding, is you can't, there's an existing federal law, you can't, you can't protest in front of the home of a Supreme Court justice to intimidate or influence a decision. Now that the decision is made, I don't know if that and it applies any longer, but he could have enforced that law up to the time that this final decision was put out. And now these protests are continuing. There's already been violence. There's already been uh, places that, that have been uh, vandalized and even burned. So, you know, who's going to stop this now? Well, it's up to local inf- uh, officials to do that. It, that's not the responsibility of the federal government anymore. That's, that's, that's local cops, local sheriffs. That's it. Well, if they don't law, choose to do a, it. But that's a federal law, though. That's a federal law saying you cannot protest in front of a judge's house because that's te- technically viewed as intimidation. And I think Garland has set himself up for a very easy impeachment. I don't think he'll be removed from office, but I think this will go down as a scandal in the Biden administration. Well, that, that, that could well be. But, I mean, we're beyond that now. So if, if you're talking about demonstrations at abortion clinics, fires, uh, graffiti on, on the, the faces of, of uh, abortion clinics or fights in the street, that's a local issue. That's nothing but. And not abortion clinics, but but uh, also you know places where that they allow uh, they help women to to come to term. Uh, that's I think where most of these attacks are, are yeah. coming from. The, yeah, the Christian the Christian version of uh, Planned Parenthood, which does not do abortions, those have actually been under attack over the weekend. Yeah. Now uh, Biden actually did come out with a statement today where he says you know he doesn't want any violence. So the first time he's really addressed it like that. You know, up until now didn't say a darn thing about any of the violence going on. But now I think he's trying to get ahead of it because they do expect more violence and some of it could be severe. Well, you know, if, if it's hard to know. Um, I think Mark is correct. These, these protests are going to ebb. Um, and then at, at some point, there might be another resurgence before the, the vote in November. But generally... It's not going to be a, a, a summer full of, of demonstrations. I don't think that's going to happen. There will be pockets of these types of demonstrations where, where people are active, you know, the Bostons and the San Francisco's and places like that. But those are places where they don't have to worry about abortion anyway. You know, to turn it around, you say justice is appointed by Biden. He'd need at least two to turn it around. And <laughs> Slim Pickens that he's going to get that done before the midterms, and if the midterms sweep in a red wave in Congress, then he's, there's no way he's going to be able to appoint any liberal justices before his term expires, correct? He, well, I'm sure he wouldn't be able to appoint anyone. Look what they did with Merrick Garland. They had more than a year and a half left in the, Biden, the uh, Obama presidency, and the Republicans wouldn't put anybody on the court. You know, until they got their chance to pack the court the way they have. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it, the sideshow will continue depending on how, what happens in November. But, you know, the, the whole tone here, you know, it, it's becoming more and more divisive. It's becoming more and more severe. Uh, sides you know, are being drawn and entrenched. Uh, you know, we've always had division in this country, e- even, you know, back in the 60s that we were products of. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had the anti-war protests, but that was largely uh, college kids and some of the adult um, <clears throat> people that were influencing them. But it didn't spread. Uh, that kind of dissent didn't spread throughout as broadly mm-hmm. through the population back then as it is now. Now, everybody is on one side or the other. And is this a healthy trend? Or is it a, a destructive trend for the nation? Mark? I'm going to go with destructive. Um, the politics have become, you know, it's now if you know if you're a Democrat, you, want, you vote Democrat, whether you agree with them or not. If you're Republican, you vote Republican, whether you agree with them or not. And it's not no longer, it's no longer about what's in the best interest of the country. It's now what's in the best interest of the party. And I think that's just going to cause problems because when the Democrats are able to pull something out of the, the, the pull a rabbit out of the hat and get something they want. Well, the second the Republicans have a chance to pull a rabbit out of their hat, they're going to do it. And all you're doing is just calling animosity back and forth on each other. 
And the people in the middle who traditionally decide the presidency every four years, the 20% in the middle, and you talked about the, 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 the entrenched uh, percentages on both sides, 40% Democrat, 40% Republican. Every time we vote for president, the 20% in the middle always decides the White House. Well, aren't, and, most, aren't, aren't most of the polls now showing that that 20% of the middle, the independent vote, is tending Republican more than Democrat? Well, I don't know. It depends on whose polling you're looking at, whether it's a push poll, whether it's a legitimate poll. You know, if you if you phrase a question in a specific way, you can get anything skewed right. to your favor. Oh, right. And and uh, I think that's that's one of the problems. We don't know how the questions were asked, where the samples were made. And, you know, it that's the problem with polling. Uh, it, there's so many different pollsters out there that you don't know who's doing it the best way and who's not. Well, I, I think for regards to what somebody said, I saw this on the news today that um, um, one million Democratic voters have now officially switched parties to the Republican Party. I mean, a million's not a lot, but I think it's got to worry the Democrats that there's a trend that they're losing people from their party. I mean, look at the polling. You know, Hispanics historically have been very uh, strong supporters of the Democratic Party, but there's been a huge shift towards Republicans. And I think the Roe v. Wade thing is going to help because Hispanics are very strong, devout Catholics. Uh, they're very anti-abortion. I think this is going to be a plus for more Hispanics to come Republican. Yeah, it could well be. I mean, you know, I think that um, it's it's not axiomatic to say that um, all Hispanics are going to follow the church's lead on this. There are plenty of Catholics who don't subscribe uh, to the church's position on abortion. Plenty of them. Um, and so whether the Hispanics are going to be any more resolute in their support for um, what the court has done, I think remains to be seen. But again, you know, according to the polls, and again, they could be push polls, or they, they could be sacked, but the polls uniformly now are showing that the economy is, you know, the top of the list for concerns for voters going into the midterms. Uh, the abortion issue, I think, comes down three or four down the line. Uh, it, it's the economy, it's uh, law and order, it's the border. Uh, immigration, yeah. Immigration, yeah. So, I mean, how much this is going to influence the midterms, I'm not really sure. I mean, th those who are entrenched aren't, aren't going to um, change their votes over this. Those who are kind of on the fence, you may get some crossovers, but I don't think it'd be enough to uh, counter the expected tidal wave coming, you know, if that's a valid <coughs> a valid uh, uh, analysis of what's coming, uh, it, it wouldn't be enough enough to, to, to turn it the other way, Brian. I don't see that at all. I mean, but you- Well, look, we, we talked about this in one of the previous sessions we had here. Until you see movement in individual polling in swing states go against the Democrats big time, and I haven't seen any of that yet, in any swing state, the, the polls are relatively stable. If you see things start to really move in the direction of the Republican Party over the summer months when people are traditionally, you know, apolitical because they want to get on vacation, they want to do things other than listen to people like you and me, um, then I might say the red wave is on the way. Uh, until that time, I, I I don't think it's there yet, you know. I just don't. Well, uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, I think, as a closing uh, comment for me, in order to keep this uh, issue at high fever pitch, there has to be these continuing demonstrations, and they have to get more and more disruptive and radical, and even perhaps criminal with some of the activity. And if that occurs, the issue will remain alive, but I think it's going to turn off more people than keep more people aboard. Closing comments, what you guys think? Brian, first. Well, I think if, if things go violent, yes. Um, but the majority of these demonstrations have been peaceful. There have been some where two sides went at each other and, you know, there's a fight in Providence. I saw some, some video of, and, uh, you know, and... Who knows who threw the first punch? Who knows who said the first insult? We don't know. Um, 
if if there is a reticence on the part of demonstrators uh, to engage in violence, then I would say that that's that's a good thing for Democrats. If, as you say, there's a lot of it, then that's a trouble. That's trouble. <coughs> Mark? Well, one thing I'll add, you know, I think we've talked about this before, you know, um, uh, Dr. Lichman did a huge study called the 13 Keys to the White House on <laughs> what it takes to get reelected as a president or the party get reelected as president. And if you look through those keys, one of the keys, if you have um, – mass protest across the country that's actually a strike against you to be reelected. uh with donald trump you had all the um george floyd protests that was the strike against donald trump on the 13 keys so um right now if you do the calculations with the protest um joe biden sitting at a negative seven on that score and after the midterms he's going to be sitting with a negative eight and it only requires a negative six to lose the white house that could well be that could well be but Again, if the swing state polling uh, stays where it is, it's going to be very hard to predict this, these, these November elections. Um, if you see a swing to the right, then I agree. It'll be a red wave. Well, we'll see in a few short months. Mark, you had something else to add? Well, one thing I was going to add, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the polling. If you go to, you know, a real, well, I think realpolitics.com, yeah. um, Joe Biden's approval ratings are actually not only below where Donald Trump's was at, but Donald Trump's, Donald Trump's lowest score, uh, lowest approval rating only lasted for about two weeks. Joe Biden has already crashed through that low and has stayed there for six months. I mean, real clear, that's, a, that's an average of multiple polls. Biden's right now scoring the worst approval rating of any president we've had in the last 50 years. I don't really see him having a very successful midterm. That's only a year and a half into his term also. Well, we'll, yeah. see, we'll see in a few short months. Guys, thanks once again for being here. And all of you out there, thanks for joining us once again. And more to come very soon. Thanks. Thanks.